Great relationships don't just happen, they're designed. But how do you get the love you really want when you haven't had the models and examples you needed? We've learned the hard way that talking about stuff can change everything, but it doesn't come naturally, and that's normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the ups and downs of creating a custom-built love. We'll get personal and talk about what's worked for us, hear from Jolie about what the research can teach us about love, and answer listener questions. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hi. Let's talk about shared values. Ah. Let's talk about how um, how we get on the same page and how we even know what our own pages are. Oh, yeah. I mean, right away you start off good because <laughs> um, when I ask people to make their relationship agreements, I'm all, I, I generally am, am asking them to get clear on what underlies those agreements mm-hmm. too, right? Shared values, your your own your your unique values that are prioritized for you. I mean, the word values has it. It's it's right there. Like etymologically here we're talking about if it's your va- like there are lots and lots of values. If I were to throw a thousand cards covered with value word value related words at you and say, "You pick some." Mm-hmm. You know, you'd have to prioritize. Um, the word, um, the word values implies a prior prioritization, right? But it's important to me that we're talking about our personal prioritization of values before we get well, yeah, to the shared. Ones. I was thinking about that that early, early in our relationship, and probably not even all that early. I knew shared values was an important thing, so I was looking for shared values, not looking at my values and seeing what was shared but looking for ways that we could have shared values. It's like backwards. Yeah, it's not. What I find is that that is over-reliant on agreement and can Mm. really open the door to uh, self-abandonment or a a complete um, just walling off of stuff that I think you won't also value. Yeah. Um, Another word for what I was doing there was enmeshment, like trying to just be part of your stuff rather than be me. And share with you. Okay. So if we want to create shared values, um, and the reason I do this is because I want to get folks to shared purpose. Uh-huh. So like this is this is part of a grand scheme on my part. <laughs> um, I want share. I want to know your individual values, your your individual prioritized values, so that then we can come up with what what are the core values that you share that you build this relationship on. Yeah. And then from there, a conversation about what is this relationship for? Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, what's it for? Yeah. Really? Because I, you know, that get, that question gets skipped over. We did a very, very early episode about relationship purpose um, because it, purpose is a chapter in my book, Project yep. Relationship. But we haven't really revisited it that much since then. Um, and what I find is that when people know what their relationship's purpose is, a lot of fights can stop. They won't necessarily stop of their own accord, but you can choose to just set them down because they have nothing to do with the purpose of your relationship. Um, so this is an opportunity to create, to leave behind some of the strife that is really just acting out something that has nothing to do with the, mm-hmm. the relationship in front of you. So let's go back to the beginning now, because it starts with values. Um, Figuring out what your values is are is your values like you have one in. I have my value is (laughs) Um, figuring out what your values are. I think it's one of the first acts of individuation um, that I watch teenagers go through. Right. So we have a house full of teenagers and young adults. And at some point, they start to determine, they start to differentiate from us and from their other parents, start to differentiate from those who raised them, differentiate their core values from their parents' core values. 
and it's fascinating to watch. Sure is. Um, is because it? they actually don't. They their values aren't aren't all the same as ours. Yeah. And maybe even more importantly to notice is they prioritize them differently. Right. Yeah. Like we, I have a real. I personally have a high value um, on honesty. A really high value. I. It's it's right up at the top for me on honesty and forthrightness mm -hmm. like a really um active form of honesty really important for me and i and i like that i i value it in my relationships not all of the kids do some of yeah. them have a really high value on keeping the peace yep and right. um and privacy over sharing oh, over those, sharing, yeah. those and i used to take that personally it's taken time to say, oh, that's not just, that's, there is no right here. You know, like. This is a, a personal, your, your personal values are your personal values. values and and <laughs> it is tricky as a parent to. Because to, you're both trying to pass. You're trying to pass the values, values on, which and... you, like, there's, there's no guarantee you'll be successful. And there's no reason that you should be successful. And that's the hard part yeah. for me. It's like, yeah. no, but 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 I really believe in recycling. And they're like, eh. No, right. but no, but you see why, right? Yeah. Eh. Yeah. I mean, it's not that, you know. Yeah, I mean that's a there's a simple example, right? Yeah. Like there's uh there are all sorts of values that we pass on, and some of them aren't even necessarily important to us. Each of yeah. us has a set of values, right. and some of them were handed to us, lock, That's stock, right. and barrel, from our parents and our churches, and yep. and we've just carried them along, you know, and and acted on them without real reflection. Yep, and this is one of the reasons it's good to have kids, because they look at them, and some set of those they're going to be like, uh, yeah, no, yeah, that doesn't no, make any sense not. to me, and and I then mean, all of our and kids, then I might look at it and say. Oh, you're right, because <laughs> I never looked at it that closely. Yeah, so religion and adherence to religions yeah. is actually an interesting one in our household yeah. because both of us, were, we Raised grew up going to church. church. Um, I actually went to church with my a, a grandparent um, and loved it. I, like, my parents never told me I needed to go. In fact, like, just they, they were agnostic-ish. Um, my mom ventured very close to atheism, but it was... They just never insisted. So I chose that. And you went and you appeared to be fairly happy. Like you ensconced yourself there in that world. I would have been world. happy not to go, you know, when, as a kid. And, but, you know, I did the thing and, and there were people around. And so we both it was okay. like mm. the community of it even yep. now. Even yeah. though most of the values, like the core values of the churches we grew up in aren't really aligned anymore. So we, we don't have a church home but right. both of us like the feeling of oh yeah it. i did like that community yeah and so we have around. tried to bring our kids to various churches we've tried going to the unitarian church and bringing them and a couple of them thought it was really yep. great a, a nice match and most of them were like oh hell no <laughs> they were just they wanted no part yes, of that it's... like right at their core they were like this yeah. is not a value for me in fact this is antithetical to my values and yeah. so we both had a real wake-up call that mm -hmm. Um, they weren't just going to accept stuff. Yeah. And then we had to decide what to do with that. Yeah, because we do value critical thinking. Yep. But this is a pain. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's the thing. They've been a good lesson for me because there are so many of them. Um, yeah. We've been able to see so many variations yep. on the theme. So we, we provide them with values. Their other parents provide them with values. Their grandparents have also modeled values for them. And then they make their own thing yeah. out of it. And having all these different little humans grow up into their own value orient, they ha each have their own axiology, you know, their their own sense of values. Is that what axiology is? Yeah, like okay. like epistemology, the and the ontology and the. This axiology. is for values. Okay. Yeah. So okay, gotcha. so um, if I apply that to my partners. If I take that understanding that my children are not going to necessarily have exactly my values and I apply it to my partners, well, I have found it works very well <laughs> because I love my children so much and I value them and I appreciate them and I don't just tolerate their different values. I actually really enjoy them. Our so oldest son has a very strong difference of opinion 
bet- on a few really core things yeah. around relationships in yeah. particular. And I really value the conversations he and I have had mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. It's helped me to understand the monogamous perspective more. It's helped me to understand what it has felt like for him to witness divorce and and its impact and why he might feel differently about relationships in general. And and I value that so much. It's been so wonderful that yeah, I don't I don't need or want him to agree with me or to adopt my values. And it's very easy for me to love him not just in spite of being different from me, but because he's different from right. me. I used the word enmeshment earlier and, and the sort of, a, a, I don't know what's the opposite, but, but an alternative to that is seeing the other yeah. that the other person is, the, yeah. the capital O other that I hear you talk about. That's such a great idea. So there's you, your, your divine, whole, autonomous sovereign you. Sovereign self. Yep. Yep. Sovereign self who is not me. Yeah. And, um, and really it honoring is. It's, that. It's exciting and amazing to that that someone mm. other would choose to share what's going on with them with me. I so I it also is exciting find to see it the to kids be, like that. It's a wonderful place to withdraw blame. Like mm. it would be easy for me to take my eldest child's, uh, my eldest son's words and take them personally. Like take them in and right. and take um, them as an accusation or a. Judgment a judgment or, uh, against yeah. myself. But, but he doesn't actually mean them that way. Right. He's just thinking for himself and about right. himself and what he's... Yeah. What it, his values are. What his values are. and so, oh, so that is such a thing. My values are different from yours. One of us must be wrong. There we that, go. That's a thing that comes up all over the place. So I find it really helpful to do values exercises because it's a reminder that all of these different words that we assign to values they they all have they they all have inherent meaning in themselves and the thing i want is to relate to that sacred other the other that is you so that i am not alone in this world yeah <laughs> i right. want to relate to you as other yep. not as unified extension with me of... extension mm-hmm. must align in all ways yeah and so i I find myself sometimes going through one of the values exercises I like is I have I have a couple of different values decks. Um, they're just decks of cards with lists of values words on them. I like decks because I can actually like reorganize them and re- them yeah them manipulate them. I yeah. like that. Um, so I'll take them out and one of them I actually made myself. They're just a whole bunch of values words I copied off of pieces of paper on the internet and they're just on index cards and I I lay them out. And sometimes I'll create fictional characters. Like, what if somebody had, and I'll take these 10 values, <laughs> what if they had those as their top values and I'll imagine who they might seem like they were to That's me. That's fun. And and I'm not a fiction writer, so maybe fiction writers everywhere are just going like, well, duh, this is just what we do. I, I don't know. Um, but when I do that, I'm immediately struck by, ooh, I want to know this person. I want to ask them some questions because they're going to look at the world so uh-huh. differently. But then, as a thought experiment, I will ask myself, how would I relate to this person? Okay. And what I do is look for, so in this stack of values that, that, that are strongly held for them, where could we find some common ground? It's not going to be all of them. But I've yet to deal out a set that I couldn't find some common ground with. And this is what happens in my, uh, in my consulting room as well. You know, I meet with people from all over the world who have lived very different lives and have different values. And one of the things I really believe in is that as a coach, I am relating to my clients. Mm-hmm. We are in relationship and that matters. Um, I that's, that's a foundational principle for how I work is that the I, thou relationship. Um, so when I find that common ground, now we can build our our communication based on the differences that we have and the similarity we have a touchstone to come back to and that's the heart of this getting clear on what my values are before i try to create shared values with you right yep lets me start honoring my inner boundaries we did a great episode with melissa height on inner boundaries and if you're looking for inner boundary work go to higher sex education her course is hands down the best i've seen for this 
if um if you've never done inner boundary work then setting up your own ba- your own values before you set them up with your partner might feel a little disquieting it is i, I have setting. found it disquieting um having to claim that this is me that this is what i so believe this can be an incredibly intimate exercise mm-hmm. So I like, um, I do recommend, like, you can download, we can throw a couple links in for some different values yeah. lists um, into the show notes. There are lots of them. Um, if you just type into Google lists of values, you'll see several different ones come up. Um, I like to cut them all up, um, if they're little scraps of paper even, and on your own, give yourself 30 minutes to sort through them. And what I do is usually I'll, I'll sort through into two piles yes and no yeah um and then i'll sort the yes pile into yes and no so i'll do it like three times because i like to get down to about five to ten values really i like ten because that's that gives you enough space to incorporate values around self and others and connection and loyalties and you know things like that there's Mm -hmm. it can be nice to have some breadth there um and then i like to prioritize them yeah actually prioritize them and remember that they're not going to stay static i do values exercises Mm -hmm. at least once a year sometimes three or four times i'll check in with myself because i want to know if i'm being um inconsistent with myself or if if i'm changing and growing so sorting these is a great exercise on your own on your own and i'm gonna give our listeners some unsolicited advice if you're like me don't do it for more than half an hour oh don't give yourself extra time because I can waffle and be indecisive and second guess all day, all day. So you might even want to set yourself a, a timer, timer for like 15 minutes yes. and do it fast. Do it fast. Um, that um, might be this... a little bit like the the advice to do it drunk and do it sober. I, I don't advise doing it drunk because I don't advise <laughs> heavy, drunk heavy drinking for any list. reasons. These are my drunk values priorities. These are my okay. sober. <laughs> Funny party game, I guess. But, <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay. Um, yeah, anyway. But, a time, a, a short time span. And in fact, I, because I do values lists frequently, um, I usually do them very quickly. It's usually a 10 minute exercise for me to sort through, make some sense out of them mm-hmm. for myself, and then take a couple of minutes to journal about those top five to 10. Um, why do they matter? And where are they showing up in my life? Or if I've got one there that I'm like, I don't even know why that's there. Like it's weird. Where it doesn't show up from? anywhere. Yeah. Um, or I don't have any evidence of acting on it Mm. because that's just a great self check. Yeah. But this is the important step to do before you establish what your shared values are, because shared values become something sort of foundational and they need, they do need a bit of stability. It's not that they can't change much like your relationship agreement. It should be able to change because it's okay to, in fact, we strongly encourage growing, learning. And acknowledging that as you grow and learn, your values may change. Wisdom hopefully will arrive at some point about certain subjects. But but there is a stability that we're looking for in them because it's the shared foundation it's that we're building foundation. on. You don't want the foundation wiggling around if so, it's not... Not willy-nilly. Not not willy-nilly, yeah. Um, And there are values, let's be clear, there are values that trying to be in alignment on can feel quite oppositional. Like, they can feel like, like, really, if if one partner has a very strong value of um, connectedness and another has a very strong value of autonomy, those things can be mutual. Those that you can definitely find a... They can, but they can also... But they could show up um, in your life as mutually exclusive you could be acting them out in ways that make it so that it's really hard for you to feel like you are living in alignment with each other like you're in 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 uh, an attuned state um so doing that exercise and getting clear on my values has helped me um share with you where i'm at right now yeah um what's important to me and then choosing our shared values, that gives me a touchstone for, okay, in this house, with this partner, doing this stuff, even when I'm uncomfortable, yeah, we've agreed on some really core values. Um, you know, agency is one of them for us. Right. 
the 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 commitment that each of us has that the other has agency over their own life and choices mm -hmm. and since we also share finances yeah and um and sexual contact and children this is i mean it it requires um complexity of thought yep. and a flexibility of like so okay how are we going to act what does agency look like in action for mm -hmm. us and one of the ways that agency shows up for us is that um we have an amount uh, we have like there's like a dollar amount that we have just generally agreed to if it's under that it has this is you, you yep. know it's completely your decision and then there's a dollar amount above which where we're like you have agency and you can act on this but but the, the shared value we have to um to maintaining this house together means yeah. that these are conversations we need to have together right, as well. Right, we, because we're aware of interdependence and the impact we have on each other. The impact we have on each other is exactly the yeah. phrase because there there's an amount that fits into our budget after which, you know, higher than that means it that it impact would impact things. a lot of things. It could impact our ability to pay our bills. It could impact our ability to, uh, and I mean in an immediate sense. Right. So... Amounts that are higher than that, they're just, they're discussions. And I hear all the time in sales conversations how you shouldn't have to ask your spouse. And I will never tell someone you shouldn't have to ask your spouse. I often use a conversation with you as a touchstone for, hey, is this alignment in, with my values and how will it work in our household? Yep. And yeah. then I have business money that's separate from that. And it, and that has nothing to do but with that's it. Not but that's not part of from our, our household. household yeah decisions whereas in the household for example i'll ask if you want any more soup before i have soup <laughs> right so what's the difference between that and right you know hey i'm gonna go spend money on this did you have any plans i mean that's just reasonable so I think. we both value agency and autonomy very highly but we have had a lot of nuanced conversations about what the setup of our life what that looks like, what it really looks mm -hmm. like. Um, so this all leads me to shared purpose. Okay, yeah. So once you've ha done your values discussion, your values exercise on your own, then a shared values discussion. Okay, yeah. what are our shared values? And this can be a multi-part conversation. This is a great time to use that all those tools we've talked about before. Um, you can go back and we should link the earlier episodes on how to have, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, difficult conversations, um, set yourself up for success and plan these conversations, um, set a time so that you don't, because talking too much can yes. be just as difficult as yep. talking not enough. Um, set up a way for one of you to, to get to talk if, if you're the quieter one, if, if there tends to be an imbalance there. There are lots of tools and suggestions, so Put that all into place. Yeah. Follow halt. Don't have this conversation until you've dealt Absolutely. with hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Which is true of your own values. You're, you're looking at your own values. Oh, yeah. Don't, totally. don't look at your values hungry. No. All of mine would be for chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and But having this conversation, and it might be a multi-part conversation, it's not a one-time deal either. Yeah. You're going to revisit it. Yeah. This is a conversation to revisit just like your relationship agreement is a conversation to revisit. And I've found that over the years as our children have grown, it's changed especially. Yeah. Because a bunch of our values yep. had to do with how we were raising the kids. And therefore, as they've changed and become more autonomous themselves, our values have actually shifted back to like, okay, what what our shared values were about the, just the two of us and less about what they need yep. um, less and less yep. as they age. Yeah. But after you've had that conversation, there's a really interesting conversation to have about what's the purpose of your relationship. Mm -hmm. And this one can be a little scary for some folks because they realize, uh, I Never have no idea. Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, you grow up and you're supposed to have a relationship. So here, or they realize, Oh, um, my the purpose of this relationship is to f fulfill a need I have. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this could be a a conversation that leads you into some pretty deep introspection about what you showed up to do with this person. Yeah. Um, early on, what would you say the purpose of our relationship was? 
in the way early days. I mean, at the very, very beginning, there was a friendship purpose. Okay, so now now I'm realizing there was my purpose and our purpose, just like there are my values and our values. Yeah, so I think and of that as your why, like why you're my, showing up, your 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 why for showing up, your purpose, the like the yeah, the journey that your soul is taking through life. Well, your own individuation is that what you mean? I think so. Yeah, your so own. When I when I look back at the very early times. From here, it's a little tricky to know what that guy was thinking, you know, mm -hmm. what, what his purpose was. Um, although it was, um, it was to actually, what I was getting out of it was actually being seen. And I wanted to see someone too. I wanted to really, really share, really connect. Um, so it was to find out, and I'm just making this up. I mean, this is off the top of my head. You know, I haven't thought about it that much. Unfortunately, well, that's fascinating, but, though, because you hid almost all the I know, time. I know, in the early right? Days. Right? So you were hiding and sneaking and obfuscating yes, so much. I wasn't very good at it. So you were out of alignment. You were Com out of integrity which with yourself. You like if you went back and watched, you could see it. You would absolutely see it. It's like oh, because you you said recently, oh, yep, I can see that you're in alignment because you're calm. I wasn't calm. I was all over the place because I was out of alignment. Yeah, panic played a much bigger role in your life. I would panic over everything. Yeah. There, were, there was a lot more phone throwing back then. Oh I haven't God. seen you throw a phone in years and years and years. No. I Luckily, your phone had a really thick phones case. anymore. It's a carpeted floor. Does that <laughs> help? Anyway. I think that getting in, getting in alignment with yourself, I mean, it's not like it's forever. Like, you know, you, yeah. you're going to grow and change. No, no. It's... But makes it possible to have a conversation about purpose but something that happens for some people is they find out that they don't have a shared purpose because they don't think of life as a thing to have purpose yes my right. um i remember struggling with my father around this because his core value was to have life be easy that's, mm -hmm. that's literally what he shared with me from when i was little um and then again when you know, when I was older and I would try to have these conversations thinking that he had aged and he might have shifted. Nope. He really believed. And in fact, he struggled to because watching me strive, watching me struggle and push through courses and degrees and having lots of children and then having complicated relationships. He was always just like, why are you doing that? Why? Uh -huh. But I felt purpose. Yeah. And... That made it, it, there wasn't, like, my why was so clear. My purpose was so clear to me that it wasn't yeah. a struggle. But watching him, I watched him struggle with purpose and then meaninglessness. Right. Yeah. His last years were just filled with meaninglessness. And we would talk about it. And he had very little to say about it other than to say that he was at peace with not, with, with really not having any purpose at all and I, I think this is going to be one of the great questions I take into my own elderhood is what else is there because I don't want that yeah I don't want that path mm -hmm. I am like my father in many ways but I don't want that path You're right of um, detachment that no just, that it didn't, is, you it doesn't work for yeah. me um, you you have a, a value of of attachment, of presence, so of what happened dissipation. in my relationship with him was there was no longer any shared purpose. Once, oh, yeah. So when my mother was alive, we both had a shared purpose of, well, keeping her alive because she was always sick. She was sick my whole life. And of keeping her calm because she had mental illness. So it was a yep. job to yeah. manage her. Um, and then my brother also had some stuff like that. He also struggled with his stuff. And then he was very, very sick. So I we, we had shared purpose around like, well keep this guy alive and we keep him going and then when those two were gone we had nothing left because he didn't want me to keep him alive or keep him going he just wanted me to right. uphold the easy yeah and i couldn't and that's not he didn't want to uphold my striving we didn't have any shared purpose and it um in the long term just dissolved our relationship it just oh dissolved is the only word i can yeah, think of and for I, it. I totally see what you're saying i mean i've seen a lot of that 
I watched. Yeah, you were right up in guys, it. And, uh, Especially those last six that, years. Uh, yep that that totally captures. It wasn't for lack of love. No. And I know I love him because he's gone now, and the the amount of grief I feel mm-hmm. is it is is proof. I can feel the proof that I loved him actively, but um, but trying to have a relationship with him was incredibly difficult. And um, the other times in my life when that has come up are when I had, when I was at odds with a partner who, like, we had a shared purpose and then one of us, sh- like, shifted and that shared purpose wasn't there anymore. Yeah. Um, when you're when your first um, spouse lived with us, we had a we had a shared purpose. It was all very clear to me. I thought we were raising a family together. Yeah. We were creating a, yep. a bigger community, and we had these very I, clear vi- we vision and values them. statements. Yeah. And at some point, from out here, it looks like she changed her mind, and yeah. she gets to. Yep. And I respect that. But the conversations around it were really painful because um, saying that out loud meant that the relationships really couldn't continue the way they were. Right. And we never did find common ground ever again. Yep. And that's really, really, that that to me is tragic. Not being able to find any common ground with it someone. It is, yeah. Um, but it's come up in other ways with other relationships that they, they end and apparently it's for lack of shared purpose and you don't always get to know. Yeah. I've had relationships end where... I don't, I don't know why, but we lost that thread. So coming back to shared purpose, I, I'm thinking, you know, we, you and I were, we were there in that, in that early stage of our relationship mm-hmm. saying what we want is a larger community. We want to raise our family together. We're committed. We've made our anchor partner agreement with each other about co-parenting, even if we dissolve our sexual or romantic relationship. Yep. But the kids are growing up. <laughs> the baby is about to turn 15. Right. <laughs> the baby. The baby's not a baby. Nope. Uh, he's just a year and a, and, a, and a tad from learning to drive, which That's right. is so, unbelievable. So things are changing. So things are changing. And that purpose isn't a purpose anymore. It becomes different. I mean, it's different. We can have a, it's not the one it was. Yeah, so there's the thing. I already can sort of feel how there's a need over the next couple of years to shift because otherwise it'll be like falling off a cliff. Yep. Um, they'll all have moved on. You know, already some of them don't live here. They're heading off to college. They're on adventures. They're one of them's about to get her first, you know, full time career shift. Like, she, yeah. Yeah. So, so the empty nest now what syndrome are we doing? <laughs> is that's exactly what <laughs> that is. Those are, cliff. you know, so if, if your primary shared purpose has been tending to the family, Tending to the children, and then the children don't need tending anymore. Or if they do, but they're adults, and you're like, okay, but this can't be our primary one anymore yep, because you have to find some. adult children can still need you a lot. I anticipate my children will need me. I I always want to be here for them, but in order for me not to um, uh, facilitate their 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 lack of growing up, smother them. <laughs> yeah, and, and right? yeah, yeah and, in order not to get in the way of yeah, them becoming the yep. individuating souls that I hope that they will become, I gotta let them fall on their gotta butt some off. too. <laughs> right, and that means that I need to have a new purpose yep. for our relationship because yes. if it's always about the parenting in the same way, then we will likely damage our relationship to the kids too. Yep, because there will be a neediness yeah. that will show up there and. Mm-hmm. I know that's not how I want to approach this, nor do we want to count on there being grandchildren because right. none of our kids have made, the youngest is pretty, he's like, yeah, I think I want to have kids. So first off, that's a long ways away because he's the youngest. And second, yeah, they're just, you know, the world is different. Not everybody's having kids and yeah. that's fine. That's more than fine. Um, but so I don't want to plan my but life means, around the idea yeah. the way my mother did. I remember her planning around being a grandparent yep. and um, I don't want to plan that way. So our shared purpose. Mm. And we have a value, a core value that helps us orient all the time. It does. And that is relational individuation. That our core value is to prioritizing each other's growth over our comfort, our day-to-day comfort. That does provide a lot of purpose. It does. And 
It also requires a day-to-day reminder that, um, well, it's the opposite of that easy. My dad's been yes, trying it is. to teach me all mm-hmm. these years. Um, and it can also feel a little amorphous. It, it's not as yeah. clear. Like the kids are clear. Yep. Take them to soccer. Buy them shoes. Right. Make sure they know algebra. There, there are some like very clear things. And then there are co- complex things about kids. Like, you know, try to help them feel loved and apologize for the ways you've wounded them and all of that stuff. But mm-hmm. now that I am clear that they are grown and I'm, I, I've done that part of the parenting mm-hmm. with you, what are we going to do together? And how am I going to um, communicate about that with you? What are our touchstones? Yeah, uh, yep. Our relationship agreement is is founded on this shared principle. So it does make sense to revisit it as part of our relationship, re, uh, you know, like reactivation that we do once a year. Yep. But I also find it to be a really helpful um, thing to talk about with you I enter into a sort of um, hibernation phase at this time of year um, where things feel a little tight and a little cold and cramped. And I find um, having this conversation about purpose fits really well into that like January to March time um, because I'm, I'm feeling a sort of this sort of dark enclosed space that, that encourages a certain level of healthy rumination. Yeah. Um, So, so in this time of in in inward contained, yeah, um, especially because I point so much energy outside. Yeah, um, I think that for me, I, this comes up naturally. I don't think it's a surprise that it's coming up to me right now. We're recording this um, in January. Yeah, and I don't think it's a surprise. Day. Yeah, yep. it's like three degrees outside. I appreciate that you continue to revisit this with me, and I appreciate that. As we've revisited it, and it has, and our and our purpose has changed because the purpose wasn't just the kids. No. Our purpose has been growth over comfort. Growth over comfort. Um, for the last ten years, at least, um, of our twelve-year relationship, um, I appreciate that you will come back and refine and also um, add things because the 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 purpose is actually more nuanced than that. There's more to it. We could go into more depth. Um, And some of that's very private, um, even for, even for me. (laughs) Um, And that, that way that you explore with me what our purpose could be. So I do. I like to imagine and dream about what could be. I, I find the, the idea that in fact, my purpose could be almost anything Mm -hmm. incredibly liberating. Um, Good. Not constrained by what society has set forth as what I should do. Yeah. Um, and instead, my purpose could be almost anything. So, okay. This fascinating conversation. There's so much more we can say about there, values. There is. Look for the links in the show notes of yep. this one. I think it'll be particularly helpful. And um, until. And it's such a it's such a conversation. The values. And totally. it's, it's a constant conversation, or could be if you wanted it to be. So keep talking to each other. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode. I've got one more thing I'd like to share with you, and that you're just going to need to hop over to the website listentojolie.com. There you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Go get those guides. They're great. They're easy to implement conversations that will help you take action in creating the love you really want. It's my mission to make absolutely everything talkaboutable. She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my my lovers, my friends, my family, and you um, on a podcast. Out loud relationship work really can change everything. That really is a wonder. One of my favorite things in the whole world. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way that you'd hoped in your relationships, I want you to remember that relationships can be messy, and that's good news. 